Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Professor Richard Blackett for inviting me to Vanderbilt, my first visit, believe it or not. I can't believe it myself, and it's a beautiful campus. And I especially want to thank him for arranging that 78 degree weather, which people from the East Coast especially need, because we've been freezing. Recall Antigone, that powerful figure of woman in Western culture, Sophocles' fourth century BC tragic character. She buried her traitorous brother against the express prohibition of the king, whose city-state he had betrayed in war. And for that, she suffered penalty of death. Antigone's primal commitment to the family seems to, be, to have been imagined precisely for the circumstances of civil war, which by pitting brother against brother rendered partisan choice horrific. In Thebes, war had left both of Antigone's brothers dead, one an honored patriot, but the other a dishonored traitor who had led a foreign army against his king. But not for Antigone, the state's distinction. Uh, to her, there was no patriot or rebel, only brother, my own flesh and blood, and woman's obligation to, perf to perform the death rites that honored both. Antigone's commitments were entirely antecedent to those of civic and political life. She buried her brother and was mourned by the city for her glorious action. Sophocles' Antigone was a powerful representation of women's belonging to the realm of kinship, not citizenship, household, not polity, family, not state. It speaks still to issues of universal significance touching on the human condition. One finds expressed in many cultures a deeply human reluctance to see women as parties to war. And the United States in the Civil War is no exception. Even there, where war reached proportions not often matched in human history, parties to the conflict on both sides retained and only reluctantly and partially surrendered assumptions about women's non-participation in the struggle. Women could be victims of war, often booty in it, but not perpetrators of it. North and South alike in 1861, assumptions about women's position in the conflict were expressions of each society's fundamental commitment to gender difference itself. As in Antigone's Thebes, the conditions of war seem to demand those distinctions between soldier and civilian, combatant and non-combatant, partisan and non-partisan, man and woman. In the Civil War, the insistence on women's non-partisanship was about imposing limits on war's destructiveness. And given the human capacity for violence, the need was urgently felt. We do not make war on women and children. It is the men with arms in their hands upon whom we make war, one Illinois private wrote early in the Civil War. The women are entitled to protection, even if they are the wives and daughters of rebels. Men were the parties to war, women and children the parties to be protected. The Civil War record holds abundance, abundant evidence of that mythic need of military men's repeated faith that women were not the enemy. And that's part of the reason that you see these very poignant images of women on battlefields and in destroyed cities. And the women are never presented as perpetrators, but as victims. But part of the untold story of the American Civil War is how that evidence of faith uh, that women were not the enemy accrued in the record because it accrued in part as a litany of painful betrayals. For in ways no one anticipated at the outset, the war saw the collision of deeply held gender assumptions with a far more hi historically contingent set of developments bearing on women's political behavior. Indeed, for military men on both so sides of the conflict, the Civil War involved a series of startling confrontations with women engaged in what could only be called political acts. Envisioned as outside politics, women were instead encountered as uh, intense parties to the struggle. As fiercely secesh women in Union-occupied territory, spies of both stripes in Union and Confederate capitals and territory, informers and enemy abettors in the guerrilla warfare of the border states, bands of Unionist dissenters, enemy collaborators and harborers of deserters and guerrillas, and even as soldiers in the Confederate ranks, about 250 at last count. Military men, state officials and politicians alike struggled throughout the war to contend with the strategic implications of women's partisan engagement. So while the men retained an all-too-human desire 
to see women as members of a family world that was a sanctuary from war, there was also a growing recognition on both sides of women's political identity and capacity. One can see it in the myriad ways officials moved over the course of the war to hold white women accountable for their actions, politically and militarily, and most dramatically in their growing willingness to handle women, quote, speedily and roughly, as a Mississippi judge put it to Jefferson Davis. There was to be no more leniency shown to the women, he said. The new view of white women that evolved represented a considerable departure from the secessionists' national script. At worst, it amounted, as some charged, to waging war on women. The recognition that women were not outside war was one reached with the greatest reluctance. Nobody north or south expected to have to contend with the women. In the antebellum period, white women, although citizens, had never been of any interest to state officials. As married women, the state had reached them, if at all, through their husbands. But the limits of that customary respect for coverture of men's right to run their own households and rule their women without interference from the government was qu quickly reached in the South as the scale of the state's activities increased, the demands on its citizens intensified, and it geared up for a war that would test the political loyalty of every man, woman, and child, slave and free, in the new Confederate States of America. In the American Civil War, white Southern women's politics and allegiance came to matter as never before. And taken as a whole, the swirling developments around the matter of women in war amounted to nothing less than an assertion and reluctant recognition of women's political personhood and capacity for treason. Then the idea of women as outside war, Antigone's claim, was as nothing. In the late spring of 1861, as men poured into the armies of the North and the South by the thousands and towns and rural districts emptied of men, who watching could have doubted that war was men's work? In pic images like this, you see men going off to war and women in the position of spectators on the balconies. Um, but that civilizational touchstone, the one that marked the limits of war, was a lot less certain than it appeared. Already in the first summer of the war, a few developments foreshadowed the struggle to come. The discovery of women spies, for example, in the Union capital. You have held me, sir, to men's accountability, the spy Rose O'Neill Greenhow, ardent secessionist from Maryland, charged to the U.S. Secretary of War as she sat under house arrest in Washington, D.C. in the sweltering spring of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the sweltering summer of 1861. Mrs. Uh, by the way, this is an image of Rose O'Neill Greenhow imprisoned in Capitol Prison in Washington, D.C. with her daughter. Very strange image because it looks like a formal portrait, but it's actually done in a prison yard. And she was sent to jail with her daughter uh, because of, I guess, maternal ties to young children. This is a, a copy of a coded letter that Rose O'Neill Greenhow that was seized in her house in the summer of 1861, uh, conveying information about troop movements in a code that she was on the payroll of the Confederate government and Jefferson Davis had correspondence with her. So she was acting as a spy for the Confederacy within Washington, D.C., and she was caught early on. Mrs. Greenhow was not the only one shocked by that development. When they threw her in jail, she said, you have held me, sir, to man's accountability. I'm just a woman. Um, nobody in August 1861 was much worried about the political loyalty of female citizens. But before much more time had elapsed, both governments would discover that they had a pressing interest in forging a more direct relationship with married women to identify women's pol individual political views, to leverage their loyalty, and especially to punish their treason. What is my crime? Another Confederate spy, Eugenia Levy Phillips, asked defiantly in her journal. If my pro-Confederate sympathies constitute treason, then indeed am I a traitor, she said. The question of women's capacity for treason, though hardly looked for, was posed from the first. It was not supposed to be that way. At the outset of the Civil War, women's loyalty was entirely assumed. And especially in the South, women figured as symbols of the nation men were called upon to defend. In the Confederacy, especially during the secession crisis, there was a great deal of talk about how the protection of women was the national cause, and men were called to war to defend their women. The right of white women to protection was a fundamental aspect of the social compact even in war. Planter women in the Confederacy certainly thought so. The first real test of that principle came 
when Confederate women first faced enemy troops in areas under Union occupation, as they did uh, in the fall of 1861 and winter of 1862, especially in places like this that fell early to the Union Army. And then began the painful education of all parties in the reality and consequences of women's partisanship. Initially, elite women in the path of the Union Army applied for and got what were called orders of protection from commanders of enemy troops to protect their persons and property, including their slaves, from marauding by the rougher sorts in the Union Army. Sigismund Kimball, a rabid secessionist in Berryville, Maryland, and Virginia, sorry, had a guard of five men posted at her gate during various Union occupations of the town in 1862. I feel so thankful for Colonel McDowell's protection, she wrote, when they were at her gate. And when they left and withdrew, she wrote, victory to our arms, meaning Confederate arms, when Yankee pickets withdrew from her yard. Orders of protection. Incredible as it might seem, elite women saw the right to protection as an obligation that extended to enemy men. But orders of protection revealed more than the value of chivalry, which the women sometimes claimed it was. They also reflected something fundamental about the laws of war. As one woman in Winchester, Mary Greenhow Lee, put it, I told Captain Alexander, that w the occupying officer, that we were all rebels, but that we expected as citizens to be treated according to the usages of civilized warfare, and as women, we demanded the courtesy that every lady has the right to expect from every gentleman. This in an occupied town when they are, admit they're engaged in treasonous activity. The obligation to protect women as non-combatants was written into the Union Army's laws of war, showing just how deep such ideas went in the Western world. Why I think of Antigone. It's a very long-standing idea. As the legal thinker Francis Lieber put it in 1863, he's the guy who wrote the Union laws of war, and these became the basis of the international. This is um, spy paraphernalia, uh, messages hidden in false hair. This is a piece of Sigismund. This is Lieber. And he wrote this. Uh, Article 37 is the one that promises the protection of women. Um, <clears throat> As the legal thinker Francis Lieber put it in 1863, when he prepared a formal set of instructions for the use of the US Army in the field, the laws or usages of modern war, unlike the barbaric practices of earlier times, specifically recognized the protection of, quote, inoffensive citizens of the hostile country as part of the larger object of limiting the severity of war itself and minimizing practices which, quote, make the return to peace unnecessarily difficult. Indeed, Section 37 specifically enjoined officers to acknowledge and protect in hostile countries occupied by them the person of the inhabitants, especially those of women. In seeking and getting orders of protection, women like Kimball and Lee thus harnessed both individual men's gender assumptions and the gender assumptions embedded in the international laws of war. In that respect, they traded not only on their gender, but far more consequentially on the US Army's need to see itself as a model modern army abiding by the principles of civilized warfare. But there was much else in the laws of war governing other situations, civil war notable among them, and all following from the recognition that, quote, war is not carried on by arms alone. The protection of non-combatants was a general principle. But modern usages also allowed for the harsh treatment of civilians who fell into the orbit of combat or who showed themselves to be partisans dangerous to the state's cause, though not members of the regular army. These, quote, enemy combatants, not belonging to the regular ar army, many of whom operated in occupied areas, the laws specifically listed scouts, armed prowlers, war rebels, spies, war traitors, and captured messengers, these people could suffer penalty of death. And on this, Lieber was explicit that womanhood did not matter. Quote, the law of war, like the criminal law regarding other offenses, makes no difference on account, on account of the differences of, of the sexes concerning the spy, the war traitor, or the war rebel, he wrote. The tensions between women as a protected class in war and non-regular parties to war accountable as other citizens for their acts runs through Lieber's document as it does through the history of the American Civil War. In 1861 and 62, 
Union officers issued many orders of protection in the Confederate territory they occupied. A soldier's recognition of secesh ladies, that's what they called them, secesh ladies, a dangerously partisan activity grew. Look at these images. These two women are being brought in to um, stand trial for harp. They captured uh, Union soldiers and held them. Uh, they were going to turn them over to the Confederate Army when they were caught. And then they were arrested and brought in on charges of treason. This is a, 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 this is a, a northern image of the typical pro-Confederate Southern woman, Mrs. Slidell on the rampage. Slidell, of course, was the U.S., uh, the Confederate representative um, uh, in, uh, to England, right? France. France. Um, so a soldier's recognition of secesh ladies' dangerously partisan activity grew as the rigors and scope of occupation generated new policies, women's demands for protection would increasingly go unanswered. In places like Winchester and New Orleans, secesh women would find themselves held accountable for what Union officers increasingly regarded as treason. For both Union, I'm sorry, for both Confederate and Union military officials, a reckoning with elite women's politics and national allegiance started early. Uh, it was a lesson hard learned through repeated and often dangerous encounters on the ground. The idea of women as traitors, even the idea of women as persons capable of treason, was a supremely awkward one in American political thought. Theoretically, of course, as citizens, white women bore the same obligation to refrain from treason as men. And starting with the American Revolution, treason statutes had been explicitly written to include them. But in the post-revolutionary period, called to enforce those statutes, state governments immediately backed off. Nobody wanted to touch this. It was radioactive. And that post-war conservative gender order shaped the terms of women's citizenship through the first half of the 19th century, but it left in peacetime abeyance the larger matter of women and treason. But the issue reemerged quickly in the American Civil War. In other words, treason statutes that allow you to hold women accountable are really necessary in, during war, but nobody wants to enforce them once peace comes, because nobody likes what it means about the society. So they're there, but they keep erupting in war. Um, and it, ca it came again in the American Civil War. Like Massachusetts in the 1780s, the Union and Confederate states would have plenty of reason to reconsider the question of whether a married woman could levy war against it and he adhere to its enemies, giving them aid and comfort, the definition of treason. As in the previous War of Independence, the two competing governments in the Civil War would have to face the question. Did the state's greater interest lay in the protection of marriage and a husband's legal rights? that is, the irrelevance of women, the peacetime view, they always wanted the irrelevance of women in peace, or in the recognition of women citizens as political individuals and capable of treason and to be held to punishment for treason. The landscape of gender and treason in the Civil War has not been mapped, but I think it is critical territory to survey. Judging from the hullabaloo in the press, the real wake-up call for planter women came with the treatment of secesh women in the occupied South. And if you look at this map, you can see the um, movement of Union troops into the heartland of the Confederacy and the increasingly pressing nature of this problem. Um, the key development was the fall of New Orleans to Union troops in the spring of 1862. For then, as all the world would come to know, the head of the occupying forces, Major General Ben Butler, Facing the constant public harassment of his troops by secessionist ladies of the city, vowed to treat future offenders as he would, quote, any woman of the town plying her avocation. So what is a woman of the town? Well, you know. Um, which is to say, as prostitutes. Butler's General Order No. 20, 28 reverberated all over the U.S. and the Confederacy, engendering a transatlantic argument about the treatment of enemy women in war. New Orleans has been taken as a sui generis case, but there was actually nothing unusual about it. At exactly the same moment in Winchester, Virginia, for all I know, in Nashville, Tennessee, Union generals grappled with exactly the same problem of open defiance from resident Confederate women. And they issued a raft of orders calculated to control the ladies, though none, I admit, quite so creative as Butler's. It's in the broader context of these other cities that the real significance of what transpired in New Orleans emerges, for what it signaled was borne out all over the South, a new estimation of the value of women's loyalty 
on a newly grave estimation of their political salience. By April 1862, a cordon of federal power already rimmed the Confederacy, and the belligerent population to be controlled was growing fast, even as Southern women's reputation for violent secessionism was already known. How do you account for the secession proclivities of the sex, a Union general wondered as he waited to disembark at New Orleans. In New Orleans, a portion of the ladies were determined to express their political loyalties in the face of enemy occupation, and they did in ways both trivial and dangerously treasonous. And their instinct was shared by women all over uh, the South, in Winchester, Virginia included, in places that had fallen into enemy hands that spring. As elsewhere, women calculated their public actions to signal contempt for Union soldiers and officers. Elegantly dressed girls and ladies stormed off streetcars when Federal soldiers got on, flung themselves into the gutter to avoid passing his men on the sidewalk, switched their skirts aside as soldiers passed, and so General Butler said, whirled on their heel in disgust as he approached, presenting him with a full view of their backsides. The Billingsgate or fishwife style was very much in evidence, and women's little chance to wage war on the enemy. Boy, these ladies could be crude. One handsomely dressed Winchester lady laid into a Union soldier on the street, asking if that son of a bitch, pointing to one of the Yankees, was going to make one of our own men, pointing to a prisoner of war in his charge, dig a grave for a damned Yankee. And they were bloodthirsty, shocking themselves sometimes by the violence of their own utterances. One infantry sergeant in Tennessee recalled a young woman who cursed him, him and his comrades up and down, saying, quote, that if it were in her power, she would kill every one of us right here. Southern men sat in U.S. military prisons for a whole lot less than that. But if most of this was just annoyance, as Butler put it, some was hard for the troops to put up with, and thus threatening to military discipline and civic peace. In New Orleans, Union troops endured a rain of pee dumped out of windows from chamber pots and various other insults. But the straw that broke Butler's back was New Orleans ladies' habit of spitting in officers' faces. Harper's Weekly, so this is Butler, often called Beast Butler in the South. Um, this is a picture of Confederates, including women, waving Confederate flags as Union uh, troops entered the city. You know, he executed somebody right off the bat to set the tone, but not women. Uh, this is a, a broadside of his infamous order, Lord Palmerston's speech. It was debated in British Parliament. And this is my favorite. It's called the Spitting Review. And Harper's is lampooning secessionist women, you know, throwing one in the direction of this soldier before Butler's order, after Butler's order, good morning, how are you, very well behaved. Unclear that the second part is true. Um, but the spitting review was, it's a joke, and historians in many ways have treated it as a kind of set piece, and I think underestimated the significance of it, because the spitting review was also deeply disturbing. In New Orleans, federal officers and soldiers ended up feeling that they were fighting women, something they had never bargained on. Uh, one officer who had been spit on was at a loss as to the appropriate response. Asked why he didn't do anything, he said, what could I do, Davis, to two women? And that was, in fact, the question Generals Milroy, Banks, and Butler faced all over the expanding territory of the occupied South in 1862. What to do with the treasonous women? The embarrassment is knowing what to do with them, one federal officer put it. In some places, as federal officers reluctantly acknowledged, secession ladies were dangerous enemies. In New Orleans, Butler was not inclined to fool around. We were 2,500 men in a city of 150,000 inhabitants, he wrote, all hostile, bitter, defiant, explosive, standing literally in a magazine, a spark only needed for destruction. The women he feared would provide that spark by challenging his ability uh, to retain control of the conquered city. Everyone in New Orleans in April 1862 feared mob violence, and no one underestimated the difficulties of holding the place. Butler, the Louisiana governor admitted, quote, held New Orleans with troops not equaling in number an ordinary city mob. One of Butler's first acts in taking the city was to execute a citizen for removing the federal flag from the customs house. He wanted to set an example. Faced with hordes of, quote, bejeweled, becrinolined, and laced creatures calling themselves ladies who took every means of inflaming the mob, he took a similarly hard line. 
How long, he asked, would his men be expected to put up with this, with these insults before one snapped, precipitating street violence and requiring him to clear the streets with artillery fire? He could just see it, he said, the howl that would come up about a quote, how we had murdered these fine ladies. To Butler, the women posed a clear military threat. He was convinced that they acted deliberately to incite men to resistance and riot. And he repeated directly their self-representation as patriots, women secessionists of the city, he always called them, defining them by their politics. And as such, of course, they were patently guilty of disloyalty to the United States, which was now the occupying power of New Orleans. Uh, patently guilty of disloyalty, if not outright treason. To Butler, the women were partisans, quote, carrying on the war. He engaged them as enemies, and he thought carefully about how to do so. From a strictly military point of view, the appropriate response was simple. As he put it, quote, the law allowed him to do it, arrest and transportation. Um, but, and in fact, both Greenhow Lee and Eugenia Phillips were passed beyond the lines and forced into Confederate territory out of Union uh, exile. Beyond the lines was one of the punishments that was enacted. Um, but Butler tried not to create martyrs. The trick, he explained, was to find an order that would, quote, execute itself. Butler's response was so creative and offensive to settle gendered views, its propriety is still passionately debated. In the infamous order, he decreed that henceforth, when, quote, any female shall, by word, gesture, or movement, insult or show contempt for any officer or soldier of the United States, she shall be regarded and held as liable to be treated as a woman of the town plying her avocation. Far from a maladroit order, as one historian has called it, Butler called the bejeweled ladies bluff, forcing them to police themselves or sit in the mu municipal jail with the other women of the town. Needless to say, most chose to police themselves. Butler's order commanded a lot of attention for its frontal assault on the idea that virtuous women were not, in fact, entitled to protection in war. Historians have rightly identified its significance in the way it held women accountable for their political acts. But there was nothing unusual about that, as they often assume, for the New Orleans case was part of a pro far broader set of developments in which, by mid-1862, Federal officers and soldiers came to recognize women as parties to war and formulated strategies to make them pay the price of their treason. The law of war, quote, makes no difference on account of the difference of sexes concerning the spy, the war traitor, or the rebel, Lieber had specified. By that point in 1863, when he wrote those instructions, the official instructions to Union armies only confirmed decisions that had already been taken in the field. No union order in Virginia or anywhere else drew the media attention that Butler's did. Butler's order was a propaganda bonanza for the hard-pressed Confederate states. The outrage knew no bounds. It extended from the mayor's office in New Orleans to Jefferson Davis's desk, hit the northern press hard, and reverberated even across the Atlantic to Palmerston's cabinet, where it briefly became a pawn in sensitive international discussions over the recognition of the Confederacy. Most interpreted the order as a license to rape, quote, turning over the women of New Orleans to his soldiers, as the diarist Mary Chestnut tersely put it. But it drew ringing support in one quarter, among the South's slaves. In Missouri, the slave Mattie Jackson recalled how hard her mistress, a rebel sympathizer, took the news of the fall of New Orleans. Mattie Jackson's mistress, but not Mattie Jackson. So not so her slaves, including Jackson's mother, who took to singing a new song she learned from Union soldiers, and it refers to Ben Butler. He sent the saucy women up and made them treat us well. He helped the poor and snubbed the rich. They thought he was the devil. Bully for Ben Butler, then. They thought he was so handy. Bully bu for Ben Butler, then. Yankee doodle dandy. Well might Confederates, conservative British, and even the Northern press condemn Butler and defend the ladies' right to spit on Union troops. But slave women had a special perspective on the ladies, their mistresses after all, and like Union soldiers, took a particular pleasure in seeing Confederate ladies called to account. The most dramatic evidence of the long-term meaning of developments in New Orleans and elsewhere came not with the increasingly harsh treatment meted out to individual women, but the general orientation toward enemy women as a class. By the end of 1862, the Union government had given up all illusions about how easy it would be to reclaim Southerners to the Union. 
One Union soldier in the Mississippi Valley anxiously observed that we have resorted to making war on women and children. By the time Sherman brought the policy of hard war to fruition, there was nothing left of the idea that women were entitled to protection. When Sherman's columns reached Fayetteville, North Carolina at the very end of the war, one rebel woman politely asked for a guard. You'll get no protection, one soldier shot back. That's played out long ago. One powerful marker of the new recognition of women's political personhood and salience was the insistence that women in occupied territory take oaths of allegiance to prove their loyalty. Women citizens' capacity to take an oath had never been in doubt, as for example slaves and free blacks had been historically. But there is no evidence that women were ever required to take oaths of allegiance, not after the Revolutionary War, for example, or that it was insisted on by federal officers in the early part of the Civil War. But by June 1863, quote, all registered enemies of the United States were required to take the oath of allegiance. And in New Orleans, at least, that order was enforced on all of the women. In New Orleans, those who refused to swear an oath of allegiance to the U.S. government were required to leave the city and go within enemy lines, that is to say, Confederate lines. Contemporary reporting suggested just how novel and shocking this requirement was. Harper's offered an amazing sketch of the scene that ensued in the Provost Marshal's office in New Orleans. Oh, this is Beast Butler, drawn as a bluebeard pirate. Uh, Harper's offered a sketch of the scene that ensued in the Provost Marshal's office as enemy ladies, still becrinoled and bejeweled, flocked in in vain attempts to wrangle their way out of the requirement, still sure that the commander would make an exception for them. Daughterly appeals, coquetry, scorn, to the women's shock, nothing worked. And like all other Confederate citizens, they were forced to choose between hard exile in Dixie or humiliating subjection to the Yankee flag. The insistence that rebel women take the oath marked fed the federal government's new estimation of how much coercion it would take, including of women, to compel allegiance. In the provost marshal's offices all over the occupied South, Confederate ladies were taught a hard lesson in their political accountability to a state they regarded as their enemy. And these are, cop these are pictures of oaths of allegiance. This is the kind of thing people were forced to sign. And when I was making the PowerPoint for this lecture, I pulled this out of my files. I had kept taking it out of an archive years ago and thought, oh, well, that one would work. That'd be great. And then I read it, and I discover something that I cannot explain. L look at what that says. I hereby solemnly swear to bear true allegiance to the government of the Confederate States. Okay? And look at the date. May 1865. I know a lot about the Civil War, and I cannot explain that. Somebody is swearing allegiance to the Confederacy after it's defeated. Is this the lost cause rising? I don't know. But it bears the exact same form as oaths of allegiance. There's a printed oath of allegiance to the United States. And this is William Inman's from Cold Mountain, the guy that's novel. This is his oath of allegiance when he was um, uh, taken out. What do they call it when you're paroled from the army and then you have to swear allegiance that you won't fight again? Um, <clears throat> requiring women to take the oath of allegiance posed a resounding answer to the old question, can a femme covert levy war, a married woman? Clearly women's loyalty was a valuable thing to a state at war. At peace, her loyalty had to be to her husband, which is why the law, law was written the way it was, which is why women are not recognized as individuals, which is why they have no political sovereignty, which is why they have no vote, no right to hold property, on and on and on. That's very good, works most of the time but not in war. And that's the problem. Clearly women's loyalty was a valuable thing to a state at war. It could be cultivated, it could be coerced, but for one thing, it could no longer be taken for granted. Gender no longer offered protective cover for political acts. Called out of coverture, the state now defined women as sovereign political individuals capable of dangerous partisan acts and answerable for their own beliefs and actions. If the women found it ludicrous, the state found it necessary. Is it not absurd, Mary Greenhow Lee wrote, when she learned women would have to take the oath, that we should be made of so much importance treating us as if we were men? This woman, by the way, was running um, a pro-Confederate prisoner of war mail network and accumulating guns in her house in Winchester, Virginia, while she was saying this. Who, me? What are you holding me accountable for? 
they gave her like three get out of jail free cards and then they, let, they pushed her out. But I don't think they made her go till 1864. Um, so it's a very, there's a lot of tolerance and then there's not. Um, after that, rebel ladies, hopeful of protection from enemy troops, would watch helplessly as their plantations burned, would be forced into exile as, uh, as uh, Greenhow Lee and MacDonald were, would stand trial before U.S. Army military commissions on various kinds of treason charges, sit out considerable sentences in federal military prisons, and on occasion suffer sentence of execution for treason. S sentence of execution. They were never carried out. Not just Antigone anymore. This is becoming a savage war, Jefferson Davis wrote Robert E. Lee right after Butler's order, in which no quarter is to be given and no sex to be spared. The Yankee experience as an army of occupation had certainly drawn the United States into a dangerous encounter with enemy women. But the demands of mobilizing citizens on their own territory had also drawn Confederate military men and officials into a war against their own citizens, some of them women. The landscape of gender and treason extended beyond the occupied South into the heart of the Confederate States of America. In the Confederacy, the question of loyalty was posed not only by enemy women in occupied territory, but in far more unsettling ways by Confederate women in their own national territory. The problem of women's loyalty, or rather their disloyalty, assumed new proportions in the struggle against Southern Unionists. And by late 1862, in the internal war, the military had to wage against powerful bands of deserters and Unionist guerrillas. And it was in that fight the Confederates confronted large numbers of women who defied the state's authority to conscript and undermined its capacity to wage war. As the Confederate state moved against its new enemies, old prohibitions ag about violence against women went out the window, and military men began to pursue an increasingly harsh policy on the ground. In Mississippi, that judge who pressed Jefferson Davis asked for an iron rule enforced with an iron hand and hearts of stone against deserter bands, and he urged no quarter, uh, uh, quarter for the women. Against them, he advised, the women and non-combatants, the most radical and severe treatment is required. And indeed, in Jones County, Mississippi, and everywhere desertion reached militarily threatening proportions, the Confederate States waged war against its domestic enemies, and it did not spare the women. Still, there was a deep confusion about married women's political standing and their obligation to refrain from treason independent of their husbands and their ability, or sorry, accountability to the state, and it hounded Confederate officials for the duration of the war. The confusion left the Confederacy open to politically damaging charges, not least from the women themselves, about the treatment of female citizens. <coughs> A war against disloyal women might have been necessary but every official involved scuttled away from the consequences. It was in the early campaigns against the Unionists that Confederate authorities first cons confronted disloyal women in numbers large enough, engaged in acts damaging enough to be of concern. The problem, as they discovered, was that Unionists operated not so much as individuals, but in political networks. Unionist men, those who went over the lines and those who remained near home, depended quite literally on their friends and families a fact the officials hunting them soon recognized. Quote, I fear we will never be able to destroy guerrillas while we permit their friends to remain amongst them, a federal officer in Missouri said. Many men and women at home do more damage than the regular soldier because they feed, harbor, and conceal the guerrillas. In the Confederate South, as in the Union border states, networks and circuits of political life were familial no less for men than for women. They worked in kinship groups. You tended to be from a unionist family or a confederate family. And that put the men and women and the children all at risk when the army went after them. Sarah Thompson left a powerful account of how one of these unionist networks operated in the area of Greenville in East Tennessee. And of the membership of loyal white women, enslaved men and women, as well as white men who made up that network. Thompson's region of Upper East Tennessee was, by her estimation, a good deal more than one half Union. But after saboteurs burned five railroad bridges in November 1861, the entire area was put under martial law. And the pursuit of known Unionists by the Confederate government started then for real,
and it carried on without stop until the Union Army occupied the region in 1863. So notwithstanding the original Unionist orientation of the area, Thompson and her husband Sylvanius operated in a highly dangerous local context of Confederate military occupation and surveillance. It took some serious planning and organization to operate a Unionist network in that context. Thompson's account starts in the spring of 62, when her husband went over the mountains to Kentucky and enlisted in the Union Army. And he came back to raise more recruits for his company. But when he came pack, back, he, quote, had to keep his self hid, as she put it. And he turned to her to help him, as he had more confidence in me than anyone else, she writes. And you have to see the spelling in this letter. It's phonetically literate. Um, keep is C-E-E-P, and help is H-E-L-P-E. -E, and you know, this is, these are, these are literate women, but they're not educated women. Um, she was his aide, as she put it, approaching those she knew to be true to the Union cause, effectively serving as the local recruitment agent for the Union Army and the men her husband would guide over the mountains. She didn't act alone, but in league with other white Unionist men and women, and as she has at pains to point out in her diary, the colored people, slaves of Union men and rebels both. We knew who to trust, she explained, wondering still at how, quote, strange it is that these poor souls would work all day in their master's service and then go all night for what they called their ease of freedom. Sarah Thompson was Sylvanius's partner. Until he was killed by Confederate soldiers, his ability to work as a Union recruiter depended crucially on a network of collaborators marshaled by his wife. Sarah Thompson was, as she said, a, um, a Union woman, Woman is spelt double spelt W O M I N G. She was a um, union woman in her own right. That's how she identified herself. She said, "I am a union woman." She had a clear political identity. Like many others, she became a target of brutal harassment by rebel soldiers who valued the military intelligence they knew women like her to have. As early as 1862, she says, rebel soldiers were quote search in every house to whip and kill union men and force them to go in their army and in the process initiated a campaign of violence, which she says included murder, against Union women. Hers is a biblical account of the Unionist passage through the Confederate wilderness. And as she tells it, women no less than men were engaged as the enemy. They were threatened, plundered, burned out, knocked about, and abused, she said, quote, in many ways that would not be proper for me to state here. It's a very religious woman. It was, quote, not enough for the rebels to carry off all you had, be it little or much, um, but they must burn your barns and harass and ravish your wives and daughters and hang by his neck our young boys to try and scare out of them what they did not know. Some of the sons were, in fact, hang hanged. Thompson was threatened with the rope by soldiers in John Hunt Morgan's unit before she and her children were taken out by Union soldiers to the federally occupied confines of Knoxville in the fall of 64. In the end, Sarah Thompson was known best for her role in the capture of Confederate raider John Hunt Morgan, using precisely the network long deployed against the rebels in Greenville. But I think Thompson's account is more valuable, historically speaking, for the quotidian than the spectacular. For what it shows is a gra rare ground level account of how Unionist women in Greenville were engaged, as their counterparts were elsewhere, as the front lines of the war against the domestic enemy. The recognition of women's salience in the treasonous politics of Unionist communities was already well advanced in some particularly divided places like Tennessee by 1862. By that point, Confederate authorities' reluctance to use violence against women's citizens subsided fast. The turning point in the Confederacy struggle with its own citizens came early, with the passage of the Conscription Act in April 1862. For as in Greenville, the first draft act transformed aversion to military service into a crime. After that, all men who refused military service to the Confederacy and all of those who aided and abetted them were criminals and they were all pursued, sometimes in contexts of shocking violence, by the military forces of the states and the central government. By late 1862, in many parts of the Confederate South, the war against the deserters was on. Then, units of home guards and conscript cavalries went up into the fastnesses of the mountains, picked their way down into sheltered valleys, fanned out across the rolling Piedmont hills, and searched the dense river thickets in search of the Tories and bushwhackers, as they were called. And when they did, 
they found not just the men but the women arrayed against them. And then the idea of women as outside war was as nothing. The war with the deserters built steadily starting in 62. By 63, Jefferson Davis and his Secretary of War were continually fielding reports from generals about the extent of desertion in their ranks, and they were harassing state governors to enforce the law. At one point, for example, Davis urged the governor of North Carolina not to, not to suffer the actions of disloyal men too long in hopes of conciliating them. This is Vance, the governor of North Carolina. You must put such men at defiance, Davis cautioned Vance, because if the contrary policy be adopted, I much fear you will be driven to the use of force to repress treason. So he wanted him to send North Carolina troops out to hunt deserters. But like other governors, Vance had already tried everything, from amnesty to execution. And the use of force against the traitors in the North Carolina mountains and Piedmont strongholds was already a well-tried part of his arsenal. Indeed, North Carolina is the critical case in grasping how the war against the, the deserters marked a turning point in the relationship between women citizens and the Confederate government. Amidst periodic offers of amnesty to first-time offenders and pleas to President Davis to parley for peace, Governor Vance unleashed a harsh military campaign against the, the deserters and the networks that sustained them. A broad understanding of the nature of the fight and its participants developed on all sides. Indeed, by early 1863, troops sent to hunt deserters targeted women, especially wives, in their efforts to, bring, to locate and bring in the men. As in Greenville, wives, daughters, and other women played critical roles in deserter networks. Indeed, women were crucial to the ability of these networks to operate at all. For while men who evaded military service initially could stay at home undisturbed, as the problem escalated, they were literally hunted, fleeing before us like rabbits before a fire, one conscript officer said. Not safe at home, they took to lying out in the woods and mountains around their farms as runaway slaves had long done, and they used exactly the same terms that slaves had always done, lying out. And that left them necessarily dependent on family members who not only provided all the farm labor when the men were gone, but fed them when they snuck in, took fo food and clothing out to them when they could not, nursed the wounded, and provided security by alerting the men when troops approached and by closely guarding, even under duress, all information concerning their whereabouts and hideouts. Everybody involved conceded that deserter networks were familial in shape and that women were key parties to their operation. In Randolph County, North Carolina, it seemed to be a war of one kinship group against another. But that left conscript officers fighting not individuals but whole family connections. And by the time the military campaigns against the deserters swung into high gear, Female collaborators were as much the target as the deserters themselves. Quote, desertion can never be stopped while they receive any countenance at home, Vance allowed. So while pleading with, quote, all good citizens and true patriots to come back to service to the cause, um, he al also authorized troops to arrest, quote, parties of any age or sex who have information about the deserters. By 1863, Confederate governments were not only cracking down on treasonous women, they began to target women as key part of a military strategy. This was no mere war against men. What happened under those kinds of orders confirms just how far authorities had gone from the view of women as outside war or objects of protection in it. In January 1863, Governor Vance dispatched more than 300 troops up into the mountains of western North Carolina in pursuit of a particular band of deserters, maybe 50 men who had just pulled off a bold raid on government stores in the town of Marshall. The hunt was personal. The officer leading the, the troops that was hunting the deserters was one of the most affluent men in Marshall. He had been personally targeted in the raid, his home plundered, and his wife and children threatened by the Unionist deserters. Other officers involved in the campaign quickly picked up a handful of suspects, arrested them, and lodged them in the county jail. But not Colonel Allen. Commanding a separate group, he picked his way down the icy mountain passes into the secluded Laurel Valley, or Shelton Laurel, as it was called, after the family who had settled it in the 18th century, home to the Unionist, heavily armed, deserter band led by a man called Bill Shelton. When Allen and his men reached Bill Shelton's home place, the men were nowhere to be found. But the women were there, and Allen and his men went to work, 
on the women, torturing them for information. They took two of the women, tied a rope around their necks, and hanged them from a tree until they nearly strangled. And they did the same to 85-year-old Eunice Riddle. They took four other women, one near 70 years old, and whipped them until the blood ran down their backs. They took one nursing mother. Is this starting to sound familiar? Anybody seen the movie Cold Mountain or read the novel? They took one, this is not the novel, this is the archives. They took one nursing mother, tied her to a tree, and put her child on the snowy ground in front of her, threatening to leave the child there exposed until the woman talked. The horrifying scenes in Charles Fraser's marvelous Cold Mountain are simply retelling of documents sitting in the North Carolina archives. When Allen and his troops finally got the men, they took them, 13 in all, out to the Knoxville Road, and two days later at a clearing by a creek, summarily executed them all, including 13-year-old David Shelton. From neighboring counties in the Piedmont in 63 and 64 came similar stories of women intimidated, threatened, plundered, burned out, clapped in jail, beaten and tortured for information on the whereabouts of their husbands. In pursuit of the Owens gang in Randolph County, one colonel of a home guard unit worked over Owens's wife, quote, tied her thumbs behind her back and hoisted her up on a limb, suspended, so that her toes just touched the ground. Then he dragged her 50 yards and put her thumbs under the corner of a fence. Then he said, quote, she behaved very respectfully. Clarity Holen and Phoebe Crook reported constant abuse bordering on torture. They were of particular interest to the Home Guard as part of the devoutly Wesleyan anti-slavery and unionist Hewlin Moore families network, which had become one of the most powerful deserter and unionist bands in central North Carolina. Crook reported precisely the kind of physical abuse and torture dealt out to Bill Owens' wife. The Home Guard, she said, was, quote, taking up the women and keeping them under guard and boxing their jaws and knocking them about as if they were brutes, forcing them to jail when they have suckling infants, taking little children, and hanging them until they turn black in the face, trying to make them tell where their fathers is. The men say, quote, they have orders from the governor to do this, unquote, crook charged. By all accounts, the women did not exaggerate, either about the violence or the authority under which it was done. Thomas Settle was sent up to, this woman, the women wrote these letters to, to Vance, you know, reporting. Do you know what's going on up here? Well, he had given the orders. Thomas Settle was sent up to investigate the treatment of Owens' wife, and he confirmed the violence that had emerged as government policy. Quote, I found in Chatham, Randolph, and Davidson that some 50 women in each county, some in delicate health and far advanced in pregnancy, were rudely dragged from their homes and put under close guard and there kept for some weeks, he reported to Governor Vance. Some, he said, had been frightened into abortions. When arrested, Settle said, the militia, militia officers have shown me your orders as justification. Quote, I know that your excellency never intended by any order to justify torture, he said, and yet in many cases, quote, equally as bad as it was in the Owens case, the officers boldly avow their, contact, co their conduct and say that they understand your orders to be a full justification. War against women, not excluding torture, was Confederate policy by 1863. To much of the public, it looked exactly like a war on women, and the shock was obvious and palpable. Citizens, some of whom could barely write, inundated the governor with reports of the outrages, and almost everyone talked of the behavior towards women as entirely out of bounds. Governor, such conduct is too bad and ought not to be allowed, one man wrote at the request of citizens, quote, let them go ahead and arrest the deserters and conscripts if they can, and not destroy property and carry off horses and other property from the poor women who are about to starve anyhow, and to be treating women in such style. The women's outrage, f outrage fairly lifts off the page, and their descriptions of conscript officers, sometimes, quote, half tight, whose behavior towards women, children, and, quote, poor old gray-headed fathers, the war's innocence, in other words, was, quote, shameful, scandalous, too indecent to express. The tone in Thomas Settle's report on the Owens case that he wrote for Governor Vance's office was one of shock and sadness. It certainly communicated a sense of the behavior as having violated some fundamental uh, moral code. Surely it did. At the most fundamental level, it represented an abandonment of the idea of women as outside war, engaging them instead as dangerous partisans and enemies of the state. More specifically, it violated the promise of protection of womanhood held up as a defining principle of the Confederate cause, and it tossed overboard
the customary view of women as wives, insisting instead on their primary obligation as citizens to the state, demanding that they refrain from treason, even if that involved informing on or rebelling against their husbands. A wholly new estimation of women's political significance lay behind all of these developments and a new view of women's standing in relation to the state. As in Butler's New Orleans, so in Vance's North Carolina, officials had been forced to find ways not short of torture to hold women accountable, to punish treason and compel loyalty. Whatever Jefferson Davis said in the Civil War, quote, no sex was to be spared. But what proved necessary in practice was not always defensible in principle. <coughs> Roughing up women was official policy, but nobody wanted to own up to it, certainly not Governor Vance. And indeed, there remained a deep ambival ambivalence in Confederate thinking about white women's political standing and about the meaning of marriage and coverture for it, even in times of war. Governors and military men called to account for outrages generally tried to distance themselves from their actions even when their own express orders were produced as authority. Colonel Pike from North Carolina was unusual in standing by his actions. He said, quote, if I have not the right to treat Bill Owens, his wife, and the like in, the, in this manner, I want to know what he said, and I will go to the Yankees or anywhere else before I will live in a country in which I cannot treat such people in this manner. But the governor, Zebulon Vance, a mountain politician of modest origins himself, claimed to be and perhaps genuinely was appalled by the treatment of the women. Calling immediately for investigations, he repudiated his own orders, quickly trying to reassert his populist position as the protector of women, whatever their political views or crimes. It was an impossible position to sustain in practice. The tension Vance and others faced in the Civil War between new necessities and old preferences would abide and maybe outlast the war. The new view of women's political salience and standing adopted in war were no less significant for being entirely unwanted. Thank you. This is a um, notice of, um, this is actually very late, 1869, and they were still trying to capture the perpetrators of the violence against the, Owen, the Owens family. Yes. Uh, a couple questions. I'll just do one and then come back. To sure. Um, uh, my Confederate inse ancestors were from uh, northwest Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, where sentiment for secession was not strong. Right. And all the delegates from that, that, that area voted against secession. Mm -hmm. Yet my two great grandfathers both volunteered to join the uh, Confederate Army. And um, uh, they weren't planters or anything like that, just yeoman farmers. Uh, one of them was a wheelwright, actually. Um, what was protection of their women from this invading horde part of the motivation for these non-planter class southern men to take up take up the cause? Absolutely. But it wasn't an accident that they saw it that way. See, if we if we just first of all, we know very little about why yeoman went men right. took up they the cause. They, they, they didn't write very much right. about it. No, and as no, you no, said, that letters or diaries. Exactly. Like this is the problem I always face. But I do know that they said this, soldiers said this when they wrote letters home. They would often say this, you know, I'm going to war to defend my wives and children. But the thing about that that's so interesting is you can't take that at face value. Because why do they think that? Well, they've been told that by p political parties who are drumming up support for secession and war. Since the, since the middle of the 1850s, every time from John Brown, from Lincoln's election. So when planters were trying to recruit, you know, first of all, secession had to be carried by electoral means. So when planters or slaveholders were trying to appeal to yeoman and poor whites, who they couldn't win these elections without, you know, for secession, they weren't stupid. They didn't say, you know, we have to have Lincoln's elected, we have to secede because slave property is in jeopardy. They said that sometimes, especially in official documents. But when they were out on the, on the Houstings and they had to appeal to these men, they said, we free men. Our rights are about to be invaded. And they made a commonality of the fr we, we free men, we white men. So they, they said, you know, you're in the same boat as me. And especially once the war began, that was easy. Because they 
you know, they are, we are being invaded. But they were, they were drawing images of invasion and violation every time they tried to sell secession before any Union soldier put any foot anywhere. Images of rape, metaphorical rape, of the state. Sometimes they would say, they, they would conflate, they called Lincoln a black Republican, okay? So they're kind of making this racial charge that there's going to be miscegenation and there's going to be violation. It was always sexual. The case for, uh, for secession was sexual. Um, and it was always about violation, but it was kind of metaphorical. And then the war starts and it's even easier to make that case. Um, they, they drew these lurid pictures, the reeking hand of the abolitionist on your lintel post. Just read the pro-secessionist speeches in, in uh, Milledgeville in, no, in December 1860. They're rife with images of sexual violation. Not the Unionists who think it's insane to secede and risk war, but the secessionists. So they do say that, and at some level, when we say, we ask ourselves, did they really believe that? I suspect at some level they did eventually believe that their wives and children were at risk of invasion. But think about the irony of that. They sign up to protect them, right? Home protection. They think it's going to be a short-term enlistment and they're going to be sent home by harvest and they're going to serve really close to home. And it takes about six months to figure out that they're going to be sent out of state and the, there's a, conf a national army being formed, not just the county unit or the state unit, and then a lot of them lose their enthusiasm. I don't know about your ancestors, but um, a lot of them say, hey, listen, I didn't sign up for this. Because now, especially wheelwrights and farmers, yeomen and poor whites, they're being sent away. And who's gonna, who literally is going to protect their women? Never mind protect their women and children. Who's going to make bread for their women and children? So this idea of home protection is at the basis of pro-secessionist appeals from planters to yeomen. And I think it's at the basis of it because they don't want to talk about four billion of slave property at stake in the war. Not to those guys, they do it among themselves in secession conventions and when they write those Im immediate de declaration of immediate causes about why we have to secede, they can be pretty crude about slavery in there. But when it's a political pitch to the majority, the white male majority, it's about your wife's gonna get raped. And it's really strange to me because it's always about, um, the threat is always the black woman and the white, I'm sorry, the black man and the white woman. Um, and they use images of Haiti. They say, we will become another Haiti. It's very hyperbolic and melodramatic, definitely. Yes. And in fact, this, what this proves is that he sent these or he gave these orders. These soldiers go out and act on these orders. But by his lights, they go beyond. I mean, he could say, well, they went beyond what I intended. But of course, he gave the orders. And then to retain his plausibility, either because he's genuinely outraged or to retain his plausibility as a politician of the people, he has to renounce these actions, including his own orders, and ask for reports. That's why we know what happened because he told this guy, Thomas Settle, go up there and find out what happened. And then they want to prosecute the perpetrators, but they're acting on his orders. And it, this goes on. I mean, these things are interesting because like, you know, this Civil War business, it's not over in 1865. They're still following, the legal consequences of this are still getting played out in 1869. And in fact, some of the women who the Confederate government prosecutes, okay, for unionist activity um, or for like, um, attacking mill owners and mills and stealing, like the food riots, stealing stuff out of mills. Those cases are still pending at the end of the war. And there's a political amnesty for all of the men who have uh, conducted political crimes. So in other words, once the Union reoccupy, once the uh, Confederacy is defeated, treason against the Confederacy is not treason, right? How are you going to prosecute treason against the Confederacy after April 1865? You can't, right? So they're in this illegal conundrum. So they have to clear the books. So they say, amnesty, you're all, all go free. But the problem with the women is they're not in on political crime, so they're not covered by the amnesty. They're in for theft. and So then they have to admit that these are political crimes, which I love because historians are always saying, you know, this gender history isn't political history. These women aren't acting politically. But the government has to admit 
that these are political crimes so that they can clear the books because otherwise they've got all this stuff sitting on the legal docket after the war and it's like you know down, it's like Alice in Wonderland you know what was the thing about the Civil War that's so amazing is if you live in a place like Winchester which some people think changed hands 70 something times during the war you can be loyal in the morning and a traitor in the afternoon and then the next day you're a traitor in the morning and loyal in the afternoon I mean it's every time the, the, people are constantly on the alert to see who's going in and out because and, and the only news they trust is the physical movement of the armies they don't trust the newspaper or anything else so this question of treason to the confederacy becomes moot with defeat but they're left with all this stuff and the other thing that I found out when I was writing this book that I want to do more with that just astounded me was that the Union Army court-martialed women for treason against, for supporting guerrillas in the border states, what, that the Union, the Union's border states like Missouri, um, where there's, a, as you know, a lot of um, internal strife, um, they court-martialed women for um, supporting uh, con pro-Confederate guerrilla bands. And the records are sitting there in the National Archives in the military records, which is an astonishing thing. And they're all like confused, you know, can we court-martial women? You know, are they covered by the acts of war? Same thing with slaves. The Confederate uh, Army uh, guys and the conf officers in the Confederate Army at one point try to court martial seven slaves who are ca caught running to the enemy at Fort Pickens in Pensacola Harbor, and their master goes off. Like, how can you? S slaves are property. They are not persons. They have no standing in relationship to the state. They are not capable of treason. He calls the guy the autocrat of Florida. And he complains all the way up to the Secretary of War saying, this guy's out of control. These are just slaves. They're my property. Give them back to me and I'll punish them. And the, arm, the Confederate officer says, no, they're guilty of treason because I caught them carrying intelligence to the enemy. And if you don't find a way to stop them, this question of accountability again, if we don't find a way to stop them, they're going to report my position every day to the enemy across the bay. So he says they are the greatest threat to my little army. So it's the same, there's a parallel thing, far, actually far greater proportion um, of slaves who are, by the Confederate lights, engaged in treason, but cannot be held accountable for treason because they're not citizens. The definition of treason is when a, when a citizen betrays his obligation of loyalty to the state, but a slave is not even a person, never mind a citizen, and this guy court-martials them. So it's amazing. Like it's, they're coisted on their own petard all the time. Yes? Did you um, look much into the situation that happened in Roswell, Georgia, in the mills there? I don't know very much about that. I, I don't know all the particulars, and I'm from that area, but the mills uh, produced the gray cloth that the Confederate uniforms were made from, and I don't remember the Union general or who it was, but. They closed the mills. The mills were operated. The men were all off at war. Right. So there were women and young girls. Mm -hmm. They packed them all on trains oh. with no, no forewarning. I mean, you know, it mm -hmm. was like, boop, you're, mm -hmm. they put them on trains and mm -hmm. they shipped them, I think, to Ohio and dumped them. Yeah, you hear with, the... I mean, it was, it was bizarre. You hear these things. And also, one of the things that I tried... So when I started to do this research... I wanted to know how much of this is there on the Union side and on the Confederate side. So one question is, well, where are the prison lists, right? What do women get put in jail for and how many of them are in there? Now, these are very basic questions to ask, but they've not been asked. And the prison lists are there, but you have to, some, they're not, there's never, there's no complete inventory of political prisoners, but there's partial lists. And if you go and look at them, the books about them, they never tell you that any women are in there. But if you go and look at the list, there's women in there looks to be maybe 10% of political prisoners. Um, and it's the same on the Confederate side. But there's, there's, there's prisons in St. Louis. Um, all along the, there's pr they, they ship some of these women yeah, to Massachusetts. Right, some of these were like, they were in prison yeah. because they didn't have anywhere else to put them. Right. And then, uh, so it. kids until they could, I mean, and then they were just kind of on their own to find jobs or do whatever they could. Well, that's my, my point is that both governments ended up operating extremely harshly against these women that they saw in opposition to them. And in the border states, the Union operated incredibly harshly against um, whole communities, right? They had martial law orders that forced the physical evacuation, or well, that's not the right word, but the physical removal of whole communities of pro-Confederate 
um, people uh, out of the orbit of the Union Army. But you know, the interesting thing about this is when you think about it from a military history point of view, I mean, they're all, it's like Butler in New Orleans. You can make a joke about that, right? He tried to treat them like prostitutes. But he's got, as he said, 2,500 men trying to hold a city of 150,000 people. And these women are making that impossible. And they're trying to make that impossible. They see that as their war against the Union. And he, you know, so both of these armies are, the military men engage in these um, activities that are very practical in time and place. They're necessary. But they're completely indefensible in the larger cultural sense of how, how we're supposed to treat women. And individual men suffer over this. Soldiers, Union soldiers at the beginning of the war pride themselves on the fact that they don't hurt women and children. And, uh, and, but they also think it's a little bit like you know, the US going into Baghdad. They think that there's going to be flower petals thrown on their way, and all the true Union people of the South are going to come back to loyalty to the Union. And they get a little bit into the no northern part of the Confederacy, and they start finding out that, no, there's all these rabidly pro-Confederate women um, making their life hell. And it takes about a year. So depending on the, the unit and where they are, that change can come very quickly. In policy, it takes longer. But you also see it in policy, which is my, kind of my point about the rules of war. By the time they write them, they're just codifying something that has already changed. You know, it's part of Lincoln's growing recognition that there's not this deep well of pro-unionist sympathy <coughs> in the South waiting to come back to loyalty to the Union. Got one more? Anybody got a valedictory? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one. I don't want to beat anybody else out of a chance to. Okay, go ahead. Um, this is a little bit off target, but uh, <coughs> uh, uh, studying uh, the fall of Berlin, uh, I read that uh, they estimate that 93,000 women in Berlin were raped by uh, members of the Red Army, uh, mm -hmm. which is an astounding statistic. Mm -hmm. and that's just in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, in the Civil War, there are hardly any descriptions of anything like that happening to, to white women or to any women. But my question is, and I, but I've read that, that uh, federal soldiers may have stayed away from the white women, but they felt like the black women were sort of fair game for sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. is, that, is there any truth to that? Or uh, Did Thavolia talk about this at all? She did? Um, well, she talked a little bit about, right. about not, not just rape, but the violence. Against uh, yeah. slave women, enslaved women. Yeah. Um, the, the answer is, I don't think we really know. And this is being reinvestigated now by people like the Volley Glimpf and others. She I would trust. Some of the people who are writing about this I don't entirely trust. But the um, <laughs> general view is that the Civil War is called a quote unquote low rape war. I have no way of knowing if that's true or not, based on what? Official reports, et cetera, et cetera. My guess would be exactly as you said, that if it is a low rape war, it's a low rape war against white Southern women. And that the uh, incidents of violence, including sexual violence against enslaved women, are entirely underreported or unreported. And that it, given that we're thinking about this in 2011 and don't have the assumptions of people in 1865, we're not, we're not going to make that distinction again, women or women. And the characterization of the war as a low rape war would have to include the, you know, the, the perpetration of violence against, uh, against black women. Um, but um, people are writing about that now, and I think, and reinvestigating it, partly actually, interestingly, in response to the categorization of rape in the, um, what is it, in The Hague? It was only recently classified. Is it The Hague? Am I thinking about this correctly? Or the United Nations? It's only recently been uh, um, categorized as a crime of war, um, which is kind of interesting. And it's in response to the Balkans. So who, who, so it'd be the international court, I guess. And um, then historians say, well, that's interesting, right? If it's formally being recognized as a crime of war um, and a human rights violation, um, then we need to look at it again in terms of the Civil War. But what the number, I mean, what, how would we get numbers that we would ever feel we had any confidence in? That's part of the way I respond to those. 
kinds of issues that they, like I could never work on that because I would never feel I would be able to get an answer. Like we would learn things, we would learn more. But would we ever know how many rapes there were of white or black women in the context of the war? I mean, how do they know there are 97,000 in Berlin? Yeah, that's you know what I mean? Hard to believe. Yeah, exactly. Um, because they're prosecuted? No. Because they're reported? Well, if 97,000 are reported, then you can guarantee 300,000 were, you know, what do you call it? Done. So I don't know. This whole business bothers me. This idea of a low rape war, I don't know what to think about it. I mean, what is the implication that Union soldiers were more moral or, I don't, I don't, I can't get my, I don't, I can't get my mind around it. What did, it, what could it possibly mean? And I think it's going to elude us, but we can do better. We can learn more and we will learn more. But right now it still stands as the low rape war. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh.